BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. The worst smell in the world is dead badger. He'd encountered it on his morning walk down a green lane, had caught the odour without seeing the corpse, but had guessed what it was and decided to walk a different route for a while and see if one of the local farmers shifted it in the meantime. Which was why he wasn't sure the badger would still be there a couple of nights later, when he was running for his life. The first of the intruders entered through the kitchen window. Max hadn't been asleep, but the lights were out, the curtains drawn, when he heard the window latch being finessed open. He froze, caught between two lives, trying to remember where he'd stashed his flight kit. You could worry you'd long ago turned into whoever you were pretending to be, in his case, Max Janicek, retired academic, footling around with a history book, taking long walks, losing himself in Dickens. Almost noiselessly, he reached the sitting room and plucked the poker from its stand by the wood-burning stove. Whether Max would have jabbed his intruder so hard at the base of the skull with the poker, then slammed her head on the floor when she fell, had he known it was a woman, was something he could ponder at leisure if he survived the night. Meanwhile, he checked her for weapons. She was carrying a taser, but no ID. He had to work on the assumption that she wasn't alone. Max slipped out of a side window and hit the ground, dropping to a crouch, waiting to see what happened next. It was pointless trying to second-guess an enemy he didn't know. Whoever they were, they would soon know their first incursion had failed. What they did next depended on their operational priorities. Given the village's isolation, they might risk an all-out assault on the cottage. Perhaps legging it through the dark was his best option. This wasn't the worst idea ever, the taser, rather than, say, a knife or a gun or a cruise missile, suggested that killing him wasn't plan A, but all plans have contingencies and if they couldn't take him alive, they might prefer to leave him dead. If he could make it up the road, he could slip through the hedge and into the field where vehicles couldn't follow. He knew the terrain. They presumably did not. The decision was soon made for him. The front door swung open. The woman he'd laid low was back on her feet, and her reappearance galvanised the waiting troops. A shape, two shapes with torches, materialised out of the darkness and ran to join her. There could be others. There was no moonlight, just cloud cover and the black, chilly vault of a February night. He reached the gap in the hedge and slipped into the field. It was like stepping through a curtain and finding himself backstage. With arms outstretched so if he tripped he'd break his fall, he tried to run on the stony, uneven ground. They couldn't follow him in a car, an assurance that was a comfort for two seconds, until a motorbike broke through the hole in the hedge, filling the field like an angry bull. Max tried to run faster. With the headlights behind him, he could see his own shadow rising before him like a giant. In a fairy tale, it would turn and smite his pursuers, but instead the motorbike was all but upon him now, its breath on his arse. Ahead lay the opening to one of the green lanes he frequented on his morning walks. He had thirty seconds, maybe, which in the dark could make up a small lifetime, that much he remembered from the long ago. When the stench hit him, it was with the force of an avalanche, the dead badger. His eyes began to stream, his head to fill. It was the smell of an afterlife gone bad, delivered with the subtlety of a shovel in the face. He stumbled forward, grabbing a long stick from the ground as he went. A wave of nausea splashed over him. He must be passing the corpse off to his left, and Christ, that smell couldn't get worse, but it did. There were advantages to being the one on foot in a motorbike stroke pedestrian smackdown, but none came to mind. Instead, what arrived was a shift of focus. Change in the game, taking what came to hand. This wasn't so much Max recalling who he used to be as realising he was now Max. Right in that moment, his advantage, he realised, was that he knew about the badger and the man on the motorbike did not. He risked a look back. 
The headlight's glare was sprawling between them, the bike rocked and roared, and Max had a sudden notion of himself as a horseless knight facing down a dragon. He reeled and flung himself toward it, holding his stick as a lance. All the rider could do was wrench the bike sideways to block Max's escape, and just then he threw back his head in disbelief or horror or shock, assaulted by airborne filth. Max leapt, catching the rider chest high, and the two of them piled onto the ground, the bike tumbling with them. Max shifted so that his stick was across the man's throat and pushed hard, and as he did so, he brought his face close to the enemy's and bit his nose. He hadn't known he had that in him. His victim screamed. The fight was done. He wasn't struggling anymore. He was crying. Max got to his feet, trembling. He stumbled away down the green lane. When he spat, it wasn't just saliva he cleared from his mouth. He noticed he was muttering to himself, and not in English either. But it was a little late to worry about maintaining his cover. As everyone in the know knew, and many guessed, the establishment of the monochrome inquiry was intended to leave the service rattled. The incoming PM, formerly the Foreign Secretary, had some scores to settle there. The inquiry's remit, to investigate historical overreaching by the intelligence services. Its duration, open-ended. Any and all matters regarding potential misconduct by officers of the service are to be regarded as material. This can't be serious, was the verdict from below decks at the park, that is, the headquarters of the intelligence services in Regent's Park. In her office, with its frostable glass wall overlooking the hub, the reaction from the top was curiously muted. The PM probably imagines he's just stolen the keys to the sweetie cabinet, said the first desk. He'll be needing fresh underwear as we speak. But she did not, certainly in the view of Erin Gray, her latest administrative assistant, seem unduly worried by it all. Yes, ma'am, Erin said, but if they're given access to our records, I mean anything can be made to look like misconduct if... Oh, doubtless, said First Desk. And just between you, me and anyone who's ever watched TV, the service's hands haven't always been entirely clean. This is all just politics, and we know how long politics takes. I give the PM 18 months, tops. If his many domestic entanglements don't undo him, his disregard for the truth will. Now, what did I just say about a coffee run? It was two years after that morning that a dark-skinned woman in her fifties made her way across Bishopsgate as an angry sky rained angry rain. Monochrome was her destination. Monochrome her journey, too, the greys and blacks and whites of London in the rain on full display, all its grime and filthy litter, its pavements reflecting the clouds. Good morning, Mrs Fleet. Clive the doorman activated the lift, and she made her way up to the fifth floor. Using her lanyard to beep open the door, she propped her umbrella in the waste paper basket and hung her raincoat on the stand in reception. To the left was a conference room, and to the right, two offices, one claimed by senior committee member Sir Winston, and one used by Griselda Fleet and Malcolm Kyle, her second chair, and sometimes other panel members as needed. Malcolm Kyle was, by his own reckoning, the second highest achiever of his year's intake into the civil service, and he knew from the start that monochrome could go two ways. It could provide a launch pad for a full-blown investigation into wrongdoing, in which case he'd be a golden boy, or he'd be called up to explain how Griselda, the driver, had steered their bus into the wall. Win-win. Or that was how things seemed back at day one. Since then, that launch pad had come to resemble an accident site, lacking only a bunch of flowers tied to the nearest railing. Day one of the inquiry had been spent in a waiting room at the park. The two of them had been ushered in with the words, First desk is expecting you clearly uttered. Minutes ticked to eons. 
They sat waiting in silence for one hour, then three. I'm going to make a complaint, he'd said finally. You do that, replied Griselda. An official complaint? The best kind. You're not offering much support. Malcolm, nothing you do will improve the situation. How come you know so much about it? He could hardly believe he'd said those words aloud. Every black woman does. He could hardly believe she'd said that either. Now, you're monochrome, said First Desk, when she eventually appeared. She was an exceedingly handsome woman, late fifties, Malcolm guessed. We're its admin staff, Griselda said. The admin staff is the inquiry, though. The rest is stage dressing. A panel drummed up or summoned up, whatever it is you do with panels. Beat them, come to think of it. Now, your remit is quite clear, as are your rights of access. She turned her gimlet gaze on Malcolm, who had been feeling a spectator. He croaked, We're simply carrying out instructions. First desk went on smoothly. The sad truth is, whoever wrote up your remit was a little lax in the small print. Your right of access refers to informational resources only and makes no mention of entering secure premises. Your security clearances wouldn't get you into the recycling room here. That means this is the first, last and only time you'll be allowed access to the park, with me so far. There was nowhere else for them to be. Forget about browsing our archive. But you can access any case file you want by submitting a request to me in writing, specifying the reference number. Any inaccuracy will be met with refusal. Oh, and our cataloguing system is a tribute to Daedalus. Nice Oxbridge boy like you, she nodded to Malcolm. Won't need reminding, he created the Cretan labyrinth. She opened the door and paused on the threshold. Someone will be down to show you out. We won't be meeting again. Goodbye. Monochrome was being neutered and defanged before it had set up shop. In the grand national of his career, Malcolm Kyle was riding a donkey. Now it was two years later, and it had become pointless to agonise over how things had come to this pass. The purpose of Monochrome was to fuck with Regent's Park, and the one thing First Desk had made clear was, you do not fuck with Regent's Park. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Day number 371 was underway. Griselda prepared the conference room for the first interview. Malcolm had disappeared, busy with the day's admin. There were expense claims to be made as the end of the month grew near. Any spark had gone out of him a while ago. He was just killing time. She ought to talk to him. Griselda and Malcolm aside, Carl Singer was the first to arrive. He was a middle-aged man in whom youth could still be seen, mostly through his choice of footwear. Griselda never warmed to him, largely because he seemed keen that she should, though in a way that suggested he was intent on expanding his demographic rather than his friendship circle. He was on his mobile as he entered, his tone curt and businesslike, and his greeting was engineered via eyebrows alone. She caught a whiff of his cologne, something woody, as he hung his raincoat on a hook, and the others began to file in. Our venerable president is the last to arrive again, I see. Shireen Mansour MP's frequent observations regarding Sir Winston were so often pointed that Griselda suspected she thought the President's role should have been hers, though it remained mysterious why she would have wanted it. Carl Singer said, Seeing as he's the one we can't start without, and he prefers us all to be here when we do, that's an efficient way of beginning proceedings promptly, wouldn't you agree? I think I hear the lift, Griselda said. Day number 371, 
Witness number 116. Redaction level 2. FOI exempt. Excerpt from the interview with witness E.F. Sir Winston Day. If you'd just like to tell us in your own words, Mrs. F., the reason for your appearance before this panel? E.F. I saw it in a magazine. That you were investigating wrongdoing in the intelligence services. Winston Day. We were in a magazine. Griselda Fleet. There's been a certain amount of media coverage, Sir Winston. Winston Day. Hmm. Could I ask what the magazine was? E.F. The one that little man runs, who does that thing on the telly? Winston Day. I'm not sure I... John Moore. Would this be Have I Got News For You? E.F. That's right. Carl Singer. You mean Private Eye, then, the magazine? E.F. That's right. John Moore. Which wasn't especially complimentary about our procedures. Guy Fielding. It's not especially complimentary about anything. That's rather the... Winston Day. If we could just come back to... Thank you. So, Mrs. F. You decided that you had information that might be relevant to our mission. E.F. That's right. On account of our work at GCHQ, the place in Cheltenham, you know? John Moore. We're familiar with GCHQ. Thank you. Of the panel members convened to sit on monochrome, some will be familiar, others less so. An espionage novelist, Deborah Ford Lodge, a glamour appointee some pegged as the heir to Le Carre, a Northern Labour MP, Shireen Mansour, and two backbenchers, Guy Fielding and John Moore, were happy to make up the numbers. Carl Singer was the face of modern entrepreneurship, whose company had been awarded a multi-million pound contract to furnish the NHS with PPE at the height of the Covid crisis and actually managed to fulfil it. Or so said his PR department. Finally, adding much-needed gravitas, was Sir Winston Day, a peer whose forehead was so evidently bulging with grey matter that it would have been impertinent to look too closely into the actual achievements a half-century of public service had produced. Excerpt from the minutes continued. E.F. There's stuff going on there you should definitely know about. Winston Day. Would it be possible for you to provide us with some details as to the nature of this... stuff? E.F. Well, all sorts. I mean, take the canteen. Everyone knows it's run at a loss, but it's packed to the gills every lunchtime. I mean, how can that be? Where's all the money going? Winston Day. The money? Guy Fielding. It might be best to ensure we're not going up a blind alley here. Winston Day. Yes, all right. Could you tell us which department you work in at GCHQ, Mrs. F? E.F. I'm on the cleaning staff. Winston Day. But you don't actually... You're not employed by GCHQ itself? E.F. We do have security clearance, you know. Which is just as well. The state of the toilet some days. Winston Day. Thank you, Mrs. F. E.F. All I'm saying, you're in charge of the nation's security. You could be a bit more careful with your toilet doings. Not a word of this would be included in the draft report that existed at the time of the closure of the monochrome inquiry and would not have been included in any final report had such a document been prepared. The daily procedure underwent few variations. If a witness were being heard, this happened in the morning only occasionally extending past the lunch hour. If the panel were meeting on what Sir Winston described as matters arising, this happened in the afternoon. When no discussion was deemed necessary, only Griselda and Malcolm attended the office, their non-panel sessions revolving around transcription and admin, or trawling public records to identify material of interest. There was little of this, most news stories suggesting possible wrongdoing by spook services dissolving into graspless matter when reached for. If Monochrome had had access to Regent's Park's archive, there'd have been a whole dark world to explore. Malcolm, for one, grew more convinced of this with every passing day. But the doors to that treasure trove remained firmly shut. And boy, did the days pass. For the panellists... 
There were the expenses and the opportunity to put the entire thing out of mind for days at a stretch. It was drudgery, but reasonably well paid, and didn't last more than a few hours a week. But for Griselda and Malcolm, it was daily servitude. A rational bureaucracy would have applied the brakes to this inquiry by now. But the wheels of Westminster were like the wheels on the bus. They went round and round and round and round all day long. Everyone needs a code name. So they'd settled on Ratty and Toad. He was Ratty, Toad was his mole, and in the increasingly unlikely event that monochrome bore fruit, he'd be the first to know. Tonight, a February evening, the scheduled contact would be by phone. Ratty retired to a windowless room, flipped the switch that activated white noise interference, and answered a mobile, the prepaid, unregistered one that took calls from only one number. It's me, said Toad. And what do you have? Just the usual. Don't sound so disappointed. You have no idea what matters to me, only that I pay well for hearing it. Toad began the recitation. The month's witnesses, the discussions that ensued, and the lack of anything amounting to hardcore evidence of wrongdoing at Regent's Park. Five minutes later, it was done. Ratty waits a count of five, to allow Toad to wonder whether information of significance had been unknowingly delivered, then said, The money's in your bank. This can't carry on much longer, Toad replied. They could be referring to monochrome itself, or the betrayal of its working, or Toad's own reluctance to continue in the role of traitor. It'll carry on for as long as it does, he said, as will our conversations. It was possible Toad had a different view, but since Ratty terminated the call, this didn't matter. Fish cakes were five pounds for a packet of two or three for 12 pounds. The saving was obvious. The underlying issues were, did Malcolm want to commit himself to three fish cake meals in the short to mid-term future, and how much room was there in the freezer compartment of his not over-large fridge? The fish cakes were cod with a mushy pea mixture involved in the coating. It sounded acceptable, but not, perhaps, a way of life. He was living in a one-bedder in Walthamstow, whose rent accounted for 64% of his monthly paycheck. It didn't feel like he was living the life he'd planned. It certainly didn't feel like he should be overspending on fish cakes, so he loaded only the single packet into his trolley and moved down the aisle. He paused at the fridge section, wondering about cheese. Cheese was on his list. He never went anywhere without a list. But he hadn't thought what kind. Groyer? He liked a piece of Groyer. He liked brie, too. But his budget really demanded one or the other. Not for the first time, he resolved to be more sensible about shopping. He looked down at his trolley. Apples, oranges, a lot of veg, so he was doing something right. Then he turned at the end of the aisle and bumped into someone coming the other way too fast. This could have been a meet-cute in other circumstances. It was a woman whose trolley he'd sideswiped. Their collision caused it to veer sideways, banging into the freezer compartment, sending shopping flying. Fruit, ready meals, pints of milk, a jar of olives, all of it. Everywhere. Nightmare. God, I'm sorry. Damn, damn, damn. I am so sorry. Could you just... please? Malcolm abandoned his own trolley and scrambled to set the fallen one upright, a task which sounded easier than it proved to be. A man wearing a bow tie gave him a hand with the trolley. Easy, does it? The woman whose shopping this had been had gathered herself somewhat, gazing at the produce being reloaded into her wagon. All bashed about, it was significantly less appealing. She was young to be doing such a big shop, so Malcolm thought, but what on earth did he mean by that, and had red hair mostly trapped in place by a green beret. Freckles. An oversized jumper poked out from the sleeves of her long overcoat. I might have been going a little fast, she said. I'm very sorry, said Malcolm, although he too thought she'd been going too fast. Do you have everything? 
She leaned in conspiratorially. I think I'm going to abandon this. Broken pasta, dented tins. He'd have done the same if he could be sure of not being recognised next time he came here. They were asked to step aside, somewhat curtly, by an overalled woman wielding bucket and mop. Malcolm found himself momentarily askew. His trolley, ah, there it was. He turned to make another apology because the three or four he'd issued so far didn't seem enough, but the young woman was gone. Her reloaded trolley stood against the freezer, no longer the centre of attention. The man with the bow tie had evaporated too. Malcolm shook his head. He wanted to be out of here. He didn't care what remained on his list. He made his way to the self-service checkout where there was no queue for once and began loading his purchases onto the machine, fruit and veg first. Under the bag of oranges, he found the envelope. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Chancellor, good evening. First desk. Then, that's ridiculously formal, isn't it? Oh, best keep things on a professional footing. That's why we're here, after all. I have no idea why we're here. When the head of the intelligence services suggests a quiet chat, only a fool would fail to feel queasy. I was interested in hearing your views on the current situation, she said. Inside their bubble, that only meant one thing. Party leadership. Oh, my loyalties lie entirely with the PM. And yada, yada, yada. You'll be loyal to the death, obviously. But supposing you wanted him to fall under a bus... Because if it helps, I have a set of bus timetables you can borrow. Oh, please. He's only been in office six months. And we're in a handcart, heading for the traditional destination. If you're simply going to vent, I have a dinner engagement I'm late for. Not for 27 minutes. Let's walk. They did so. Let's face facts, said First Desk. A reckoning is coming. Your party broke the pound last year, and you'd be better off calling an ambulance than a general election. But that can't be avoided forever. And when it does come, the top job will be up for grabs again, as I'm sure you've worked out. You're not recording this. If I need a tape of you whispering treasonous nothings, I'll have a deep fake fixed up. Then she added, joke. You're not famous for your sense of humour, are you? I quite literally have trained assassins in my employ. If I say something's funny, it's best to go along, don't you think? Without waiting for an answer, First Desk produced an A4-sized envelope from her tote bag. Don't open this just yet. What's inside? Let's call it a bus timetable. You're familiar with Fabien de Vries? Of course, the payday loan man, among other career highlights. Currently, he was the favourite businessman to bag a tender to provide services to the government under its Green Shoots initiative, a euphemism for privatisation. The landscaping tender involved doing background checks on applicants for sensitive government positions. Were you aware what a close friend of the former PM he is? Ah, uh, yes. I'd heard de Vries can be very, uh, generous to his friends. And continues to be so, said First Desk as these timetables I've given you will show. The Chancellor stopped. Why does that... Oh, you think he'll be back? I think your old boss has not accepted that the work event is over. Sorry, I meant party. Once the dust settles after the next election, he'll come creeping out of his treehouse. He's the biggest threat to any future ambitions you might harbour, so you will need to be sure you're equipped to deal with him. What will this information do? For one thing, it will ensure de Vries's bid for the vetting service fails. Is that the real reason for all this? 
to keep de Vries from muscling in on your territory? It's a good 50%, First Desk admitted. And he's a dark horse, our Mr. de Vries. He has obscure origins. You might even wonder if he wants to own the vetting office to avoid the process himself. Russian? I think even your old boss would have noticed that's not a good look. No, he has a Dutch passport. Which could mean he's Dutch. But another way of looking at it is he's a loan shark who's made millions exploiting the poor and the weak. Just this once, could that not be enough? And in return for this, uh, helping hand, I suppose you'll want the monochrome inquiry terminated. To be frank, it should have been put out with the rubbish when Number 10 had the cleaners in. When he was gone, First Desk waited a while, then lit a cigarette and stared into the water. Studying the river gave a moment's peace. And speaking of peace, it would be a relief to have monochrome silenced. It might be a joke, but it had gone on long enough. And as with an infinite brigade of monkeys, there was always the possibility it would stumble on something significant. Well... It wouldn't now. Griselda opened her laptop and investigated her finances, a ten-minute ritual practised several times a week, which always made her feel worse, but which had to be done. Life in the red. She'd awoken one morning to find the conditions of life had changed, though most of its externals remained familiar. It seemed her ex-husband had a gambling habit. Their savings were gone his pension was gone, and so was he. So now here she was in a rented flat in Bethnal Green with her daughter, where she'd never, that she could recall, had a good night's sleep. Malcolm hadn't slept much either, after his encounter in the supermarket. Mozart, Q1, 94. Otis, Berlin, BM. This was handwritten on the top right corner of the folder that the envelope contained. Somewhere in the middle of the maelstrom with the shopping trolleys, someone had passed it to Malcolm. And now here he was, trying to will it out of existence. He was in possession of state secrets. The envelope was a crime in progress. It might be a hoax, but it looked genuine. Monochrome, the creaky, thwarted inquiry with all the forward impetus of a slapped moth, had just gone live. No sun reached the lower floors of Regent's Park, one of which houses the archive, its repository of secrets and lies. The light down there is blue, except when movement is detected along the aisles, when it softly ascends to a more reader-friendly yellow, though in truth there is rarely much movement in this long room. The archive has long ceased to grow. Elsewhere in the park, newer history accumulates in the digital cloud, the past continues to brood in its chamber, yielding secrets only when forced to do so by those brave enough to confront the warder, who moves through her queendom this morning, gliding in an electric wheelchair. It arrives at a particular set of shelves, where she runs a hand along a row of files and folders, tightly arranged, leaving no space to add more. There is little need to. The period of history this relates to is unlikely to generate further content. That said, as her fingers move along the spines, they encounter a gap. She nods thoughtfully, then carefully shuffles the folders either side until the gap no longer exists. Task completed, the wheelchair reverses, and its user retreats to a cubbyhole and busies herself with the doings of the day. The yellow light dims, as if dawn has had second thoughts, and peace descends. I'll just put it in a bigger envelope and send it back to the park. Malcolm had bought just such a bigger envelope on the way in to work. He was the only one in. Griselda was out playing catch-up with her old job at the home office, meaning it was being kept warm for her, while Malcolm had no such assurance. It wasn't fair. On the fifth floor, he went into Sir Winston's empty room and locked the door. He placed his briefcase on the floor then sat and withdrew the original envelope to look at the file. This wasn't a crime. He was in full possession of a security clearance. Malcolm opened the folder. Berlin, 1994. 
The reference number gave him that much. The first thing he saw was a photograph, sliding out from among the other papers as if eager for attention. Black and white. It showed three people standing by a wall, two men and a woman. One of the men was large and beaming and wore a wide-brimmed hat pushed back on his head. He had an arm around the waist of the woman, who was pretty in what Malcolm interpreted as an insecure way, as if her prettiness were a late-blooming gift. The remaining figure was strangely expressionless. Caught between two moods was how Malcolm read it. About to turn one thing or the other. Nice or nasty. The file contained only 17 sheets of paper, each stamped zero circulation. A neatly handwritten DC initialed each page, though there was no clue as to who this might be. At the top, a standard information form with the date, department and required clearance level. Mozart. Security clearances were once graded according to musical genius he knew. Mozart was presumably high. The door handle to the office rattled. Malcolm, is that you? Griselda Fleet. He shoveled the paperwork back into its folder, then attempted to jam the folder back into its envelope, but it caught on the flap. More rattling. Would you open the door? Just a minute. Why are you locked in? Malcolm. Just coming. Unwanted teenage memories ignited in his mind, his mother rattling a similar doorknob, Malcolm attempting to make dissimilar paperwork disappear. He grabbed his briefcase and mashed everything inside it, fumbling with the clasp, but his fingers were thumbs and it drooped open, desperate to reveal secrets. He opened the door brusquely. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? What are you doing here? This is Sir Winston's room. He's not in. I thought you were at the Home Office today. It got shifted. Why are you acting like this? He folded his arms, then decided this was too defensive a gesture, so he unfolded them, but in doing so he knocked the desk chair. Grabbing it before it could fall over, he kicked his briefcase, disgorging its contents onto the floor. What's that? Nothing. He might as well have a blue light flashing on his head. That looks like a file. She plucked it from the floor. Mozart. That's a high-level security clearance. This is a park file, yes? He found himself nodding dumbly. When Malcolm explained what had happened in the supermarket and they had reviewed the possibilities of the file's provenance, Griselda sat in silence. Whatever story they had to tell, it was in her possession now. Or monochromes, rather. Quietly, Malcolm said, the PM wanted a war with the park, and First Desk spiked his guns from the off. Those two narcissists treat Westminster like it's their private wrestling ring. This has never been a job, it's been a political game. Until now. He slapped the Otis file. Now it's a job. We should put it before the committee. She took a breath. What does it contain? I haven't read it yet. We could end up in serious trouble. Prison time trouble. If it was just me, yes, but both of us? The whole panel? We could distribute it. When it's all of us, it's a clerical error. Someone goofed up and put the file in our hands. What were we supposed to do? Distributing? You mean calling witnesses, too? You're playing with fire. You mean we are? The file was monochrome business. Reviewing it was part of her job. Griselda Fleet was a career civil servant. Doing her job was what kept her lights on. She reached out and took the thin bundle between finger and thumb, as if trying to gauge its import by touch alone. Malcolm took off his glasses and polished them with the thick end of his tie, but his gaze remained on her. She sighed. You win. He raised an eyebrow. Let's do our job. Be 
BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. She knew who was calling before she reached for her mobile. Shelley. Ma'am, how can I help you this morning? I've been hearing strange stories, said First Desk, which are my least favourite kind, concerning Max Janacek, one of yours, if I'm not mistaken. Formerly one of mine, said Shelley. He was reassigned to John Batchelor. What's happened? An attempted abduction, by the look of things. Best guess is Max, uh, thwarted the bad actors. But he's no longer on the scene. Well, he wouldn't be, would he? In the event of enemy action, evade and drop from sight. That's actually written down somewhere. And then contact your friendly, said First Desk. Isn't that how the rule concludes? I'm no longer his friendly. I went on medical leave and then Bachelor took over. Anything else I can help you with? Yes. Give me an assurance that if Janacek makes contact with you in any way, shape or form, you'll let the park know before it's finished happening. Duly noted. I won't spell out the consequences of your failing to do so. Putting away her phone, Shelley said, Well, that didn't take her long, did it? Max nodded thoughtfully. Shelley McVie was attached to housekeeping in the section unofficially known as the Milkman, whose role it was to offer care and support to clapped-out spooks. Currently on medical leave, First Desk had long suspected this was fraudulent, what was ghost pain, for pity's sake. Any other line of work she'd have been put out to pasture. This was an irritation, was what this was. Some neighbour had made a phone call to the local cops about nighttime disturbances in a remote Devonshire village which had triggered an alarm on the hub. All over the country there were clapped-out spooks haunting little houses, and on top of everything else on her plate, First Desk had to ensure that any time an alarm bell rang, it didn't mean that someone had had the past reach out to claim them. But Janacek was of zero significance. Why would anyone target him? She called for her new personal Friday, Harry, to bring her more coffee. The last girl, what was her name, Erin Gray, that was it, had been promising enough, but she'd seen and heard too much for comfort, so ended up working down in the archive with Molly Doran. The archive was where you posted things you wanted to forget. There were days, First Desk reflected, where you'd put everything there if you could. After recovering his backup car, Max had driven to Birmingham, taking it slowly. Once in the city, he'd gone to ground in the traditional way. He holed up in a cheap hotel, thinking through possibilities. He had a passport and a flight fund. He could cab to the airport and lose himself abroad. But he was getting too old and sore to do that. He didn't much fancy pretending to be someone else again. Then he went to Shelley. She limped back into her living room now, bringing whiskey and two glasses. He didn't know her well, and they'd only slept together once, three years ago, at their second meeting. So, she said now, sitting back in her chair, it wasn't the park who came for you, unless that was a double bluff. No. Even so, it wasn't a bright idea coming to me. It's the first place a professional would look. They weren't professional. That is, they were paid. But they didn't have a clue. They weren't service. Not ours, not anyone's. He'd been thinking about this on the train to London. Professionals don't burst into tears, not even when you've bitten the tip of their nose off. What were they hired to do? Kill him or snatch him, he couldn't say, but at this stage, the who was more important. Maybe you should plan your next move? Anyone would think you wanted rid of me. I'm not your handler, Max. That's John Batchelor, who may not be the most reliable card in the deck, but possibly the drunkest. But he is now on your case, and I am not. I met him once. After that, I'd sign off on his feedback forms, and he'd send me 20% of his fee. Very sackable. 
The point is, I barely know him and I don't trust him. In fact, all I do know is he can't be trusted. And you trust me? That's sweet. I barely know you, either. Though we did have a moment, I recall. She said, Max, we agreed to pretend it never happened. He kept his gaze steady, resting his whiskey glass on the arm of his chair. I've got no intention of making your life difficult, and I'll be long gone before your husband gets home. What was his name? Graham. Is he in the business? God, no, he works for Network Rail. Really? Max leaned forward. Maybe I'll stay and have a chat with him. You're not chatting with him, not about anything. Don't worry, train talk only. It's unlikely our long-ago dalliance will come up. Max sat back. All I want to know is who might have accessed my records recently. Just check for me. That's all I'm asking. And I'll be long gone before Graham gets home. It's not as easy as all that. Shelley, give it a go, yes? And then I'm out of your hair. There had been a time when they were an excuse to leave the building, but now gatherings of the Limitations Committee, the park's fiscal watchdog, happened in Regent's Park itself. First Desk sat with her back to the view of the outside world, partly because this was where the best chair was. Oliver Nash was leading the meeting. He was a friendly, clubbable type, there to implement official whims. The first quarter's overspend projections were delivered. The current hiring freeze renewed. First desk sat on her hands, thinking, I sought this job to serve the service, not to oversee its slow dismantlement. The third agenda item was green shoots, an update. Oliver's voice changed to register slightly. Item three, people. Cabinet has agreed that vetting procedures and background checking, that is to say the work generally falling under landscaping's remit, should be the next area for streamlining and cost savings, part of what we're calling the Green Shoots Initiative. The main interest here is coming from Fabian de Vries, most likely under his aegis, but always allowing for another contender to materialise. We're considering an 18-month handover period, during which any issues can be identified and resolved. Everyone on board with that? Good. On to item four, then. First Desk spoke up. I think you're underestimating the damage already done with this ludicrous and ill-thought-out privatisation scheme. We're not calling it. That doesn't alter the case. And as it happens, de Vries's interest in taking on landscaping is waning. But, be that as it may, Nash raised one eyebrow. I'm not sure where your information regarding his change of heart comes from, and maybe we'll discuss that later. We'll have to agree to differ on the question of green shoots. No, that's not how this works. This is a difficult time, but we have to work together. Let's not forget also there's still an inquiry underway, one whose eventual report... Monochrome is a waste of time, interjected Oliver. The very fact that the government chose to initiate it is indicative that the park is not in good odour, and hasn't been since before my time as first desk. Oliver looked at her. I took a call from Sir Winston this morning, as it happens. It seems there's been an upgrading of the material falling into their purview. Meaning what, exactly? First desk's tone suggested that whatever the answer was, it would be an irritation on the level with a broken fingernail or a lost comb meaning that a Regent's Park file has come into their possession. Every pair of eyes in the room was on first desk. The independence of the inquiry is sacrosanct, she said calmly. However, we need to be clear as to the provenance of this file. It could just be fake news. As you say, but meantime, fake or not, it's in their hands and the panel is in session today. I can only assume they intend to treat it as legitimate evidence. But this isn't really on our agenda. Shall we move on? There was a pause. Of course, said First Desk. Back to item three, then. Shelley was inwardly cursing Max Janacek as she arrived at her office and buzzed herself in with her employee card. What was she supposed to achieve, anyway? On the other hand, her marriage. Graham was a sweet man, and they'd been together twelve years. 
but even sweet men hired divorce lawyers. So here she was. Shelley's line manager, Bobby Lawler, was immediately on to her. Shelley, I didn't know you were coming in. I was just passing, osteo appointment nearby. Thought I'd stick my head round the door. She was scanning faces in the background. Martin, Lizzie, Glenn. Zadie, she could talk to Zadie, she might help. Then she noticed something else. The partial view of Tower Bridge from the rear of the building was obscured today by a piece of hardwood fastened over a section of window. A man in blue overalls was measuring the frame. Someone attempted to escape, I see, she said to Bobby. A break-in, nothing to worry about. There have been a number of incidents locally. The police are already aware. Martin had his squash racket taken. When was this? Does it matter? A few nights ago? They didn't take any of the laptops? There's nothing classified on them, Shelley. Forgive me, are you here to bother your colleagues or as a representative of Neighbourhood Watch? It was true, she thought, as she headed back up the lane in the drizzling rain. Their database wouldn't pinpoint the whereabouts of, say, Max Janacek. On the other hand, it could indicate that his current milkman was John Batchelor. Some distance away, tracking along a Shoreditch lane in the same rain, Griselda Fleet felt her phone buzz. I understand you've come into possession of a file. First desk didn't have to introduce herself. That's correct, but we've returned it already, ma'am. I'm aware, but I'd be interested to know how you got it at all. We don't know. It was an anonymous donor. I take it there's been no distribution of its contents, yourself accepted, presumably. Myself and Mr Kyle, and Monochrome's panel, of course. There was a brief silence. What do you plan to do next? We have an afternoon session, ma'am. No harm in throwing that in. Full panel. A witness has been called. First desk said calmly, Very well. I'll expect to see the minutes within an hour of the session closing. Griselda's heart was pounding as she ended the call. She would have preferred a screaming match. Back in her office, first desk laid her hand flat on the Otis file, for all the world as if trying to secure its contents. Whoever had put this game in motion wouldn't enjoy it much longer. She'd just had a text from the Chancellor fulfilling his promise. Monochrome would be history by the end of the day. Which didn't mean she wouldn't find whoever was responsible for the leak and mush them into a paste. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Might I ask that we lower the blinds? The witness asked. Malcolm scraped his chair back and moved along the row of windows, angling the slats so that a hint of day painted the room in horizontal stripes. The witness relaxed a little. Rather amused that among her first statements to monochrome would be an outright lie, she said, My name is Alison North. The events we're here to discuss took place in the spring of 1994, said Sir Winston. Obviously, we're not expecting you to have total recall of the period, but ask that you take care not to embellish your memories. I'll make sure I don't, she said. For the time being, John Batchelor was a local at the Fox and Bucket pub, as damning an indictment of his life and career in the service as a long-service medal to a shit shoveler's assistant. Where had it all gone wrong? Where to start? Divorce, the cost of living, some bad financial advice. Well, no point crying over spilt milk, although whoever said that hadn't noticed how much milk cost lately. Any wonder he'd stayed in his seat when beer was offered by a stranger. He watched his new friend Sparky play the quiz machine. Say what you like about beer, at least you could drink it. Try doing that with spilt milk. And beer in hand, the world was slightly better. Hello, John, said Max Janacek, looming out of nowhere. How've you been? 
Once she'd returned with the news of the break-in at her office, Max had persuaded Shelley to do one last favour and get a current address for her replacement. It now seemed likely that John Batchelor had been the cause of his recent scramble down the green lanes. I'm starting to feel like this is a lot to pay for one stray shag, Shelley sighed, but she got him John's latest address. What will you do? Check out every pub in the area? And then what? I'll ask him who he sold me to. In the end, he was seven pubs in when he tracked him, sitting in a corner holding a pint glass in a way that suggested it was all that was keeping him upright. What? Max? His drinking companion, a burly man at the nearby quiz machine, glanced over. You looking for trouble, pal? I'm fine, Sparky, said John. Really, he's an old, old friend. He turned to face Max. So, what brings you all this way? Max lowered his voice. I came looking for you. Easy to find, but then you're not living in deep cover like I was. But guess what? Turns out I was easy to find too. There's only one way they could have done it, and that's if you pointed them in the right direction. No one approached me, I swear, said Bachelor. He gazed into his pint as if preparing to jump in it and drown. Let's take it a step at a time. Any strange chance encounters lately? Any new friends appearing out of nowhere? He glanced over at Sparky. Him? No. Um, I really need to pay a visit, you know, the gents. Can I just do that? Leave your phone and your wallet. I'll come straight back. Faint music drifted across from the pub's other room. Then the door onto the street opened, and a woman stepped in. There was no reason Max should have recognised her, because he'd barely seen her the first time, when mostly he'd been banging her head on the floor. But the look she gave him gave most of the game away. The room was now empty but for her and John's drinking buddy, leaning against the quiz machine, a sly smile buttering his face. She slipped him some folding money and he melted away. Just so we're clear, Max said to her, I'm a lover, not a fighter. You're coming with me now. How's your friend? The one with the motorbike. You bit his damn nose off, on your feet, now. Max eased himself upright. The woman wasn't visibly armed, but it was safest to act like she was. Then John Batchelor appeared from the gents, hurling a plastic swing bin that caught her full on the side of the head. The woman reached into her jacket. Taser, Max remembered. He grabbed her arm. Behind him, Batchelor said, I swear I didn't know Max. Max didn't bother answering him. He felt his heart racing and had an impulse to laugh even as the door behind the woman opened. Shelley McVie's cane came down heavily on the woman's head and the light in her eyes went out. Max said, You followed me. I was worried you'd get into trouble. Ye of little faith, said Max. They scooped the woman up and bundled her out. Meanwhile, back in the monochrome offices, Witness number 137 was getting into her stride. A foreign assignment involved life craft. Things like new banking procedures, living arrangements, any amount of detail designed to consolidate a daily existence had to be managed. This role was in line with her lowly status as a first-year trainee, housekeeping division, purely admin. Assess daily procedures and work-related outcomes, the memo had said. Perhaps this was an initiative test. But however it was looked at, her new posting was superficially glamorous. Berlin Station was a headline operation, even though the wall was rubble. This, her secret self told her, was as good as it got. A junior spook, not field material, heading abroad, and so soon. If half of her contemporaries weren't flat on their backs with what they were calling spooks flu at the time, mainlining hot lemon and feeling sorry for themselves, she'd not have been in with the faintest shout. When she knocked on the door of interview room three at 10.15am on a cold day early in 1994, she was invited to enter. Of all the faces she might have expected to see, none belonged to the man behind the desk in the centre of the room. Please, 
Sit down. David Cartwright had once been pointed out to her in the lobby of the park. He's the one that drives the whole shebang. Not first desk, but he's the one who makes the big decisions. Or that's the rumour. Cartwright was a mixture of Rasputin and Robespierre, it was said, though in person he looked kindlier than either description suggested. High forehead, alert blue eyes behind spectacles, tweed jacket, woolen waistcoat. A man, clearly, who ensured he was all in one piece before leaving the house. More importantly, a man who was immensely busy, what with being a legend. Why on earth was he gracing her send-off to Berlin with his presence? And I, he was saying, will call you Alison. He glanced at an open file before him. Alison North. At first, she thought he must have confused her with someone else. Then that was replaced by another thought. Work name. I'm already used to it. And Alison North, as she now was and would remain for some while, smiled. Been to Berlin before? She shook her head. That's fine. No experience necessary, as they say. You were expecting life craft, of course. She nodded. All that will be taken care of, he went on. But there's something else that requires attention. In Berlin, I mean. That's why we're here. Ah. She could see it now. The admin role was a cover. What he was about to tell her was the story. So tell me, she thought. And in that moment became a spy. The Berlin station house was on a mid-city street. The houses were shabby, their stone facades having taken a pasting over the years. She found herself at the address, looking up a flight of steps at a door on which someone had painted a cartoonish ghost. Seriously. Later, someone explained that anyone who might wish to know where they were based already knew. The Spooks Zoo, Berlin was called. And the thing about zoos was, the animals were on display. She was buzzed in. A figure appeared, a woman with a London accent. I'm Teresa, house mother. You're to go straight up. He likes to catch them early. Do you want to leave your coat? There's a chap there at the moment, David Cartwright had said. You've probably heard of him. There are those who say he'll either be running this place in a decade's time or buried in one of its cellars. You'll be reporting to him. Brinsley Miles. Or that's his Berlin work name. Goes by Miles. She walked all the way up to the sixth floor, and when she made it, she knocked, her breath coming fast. There was a noise from within, so she entered. Brinsley Miles was standing behind his desk, his head turned towards her. First impression? Average height, broad shoulders, not someone you'd force into a corner. His hair looked like shampoo was a luxury, and several days' stubble graced his cheeks and chin. His eyes drew her attention, grey and calm and watchful. She felt herself mesmerised as she stood in the doorway. You're out of breath, he said. Not quite a growl, but a little more smoking would see it there. There's a lot of stairs. I'm Alison North, she added. Congratulations, and you're here to keep us on our toes. I'm to conduct a compliance study, yes. He was holding a cigarette. I'd rather you didn't smoke, she said. I heard a guy in a bar the other night. He smiled apologetically. Woman said the same thing to him, and he told her, and I'd rather you didn't menstruate, so that makes us even. His gaze didn't leave Alison's face. Is this meant to impress me? He plugged the cigarette into his mouth. Whoa, pardon me all the way to fucking back. I'm the one in charge and you're the visitor, right? I am also, she said, your guest, which means I expect to be treated with respect. He stared at her for a long while. And then, quietly but unmistakably, he farted. There'd been moments in the years to come, and this was not something she shared with the committee, this was a thought she hugged to herself in her secret hours, in her shut-away life. Many, many moments when she'd wish she'd turned then and there and left that office. There are so many pivots on which a life spins. But instead of embracing any other possible future, she said, Is that your final answer? 
Later that week, she dialed the number from a phone booth. How are we getting on? Without Cartwright's twinkly presence in the room, it was easier to hear the Rasputin, the Robespierre. He expected results. I want to hear about the outgoings. How much is ending up in the pockets of supposed assets whose product is fool's gold, or if they're turning down intelligence offered on the cheap? Why they're making the choices they're making? And I'm to find all this out? You're supposed to be good at taking bearings. Acquired quite the reputation at the park in a short time, you have. She tried not to blush, though he couldn't see her face. I haven't had time to talk to him much yet. Do you think he's turned? Let's not get ahead of ourselves, said Cartwright. I understand. Well, he keeps his office locked, Alison offered. Of course he does. Listen, he has a reputation for the nightlife. Likes to get out and about. Go along with him, watch him, listen, while he's got his guard down. Is that why you picked me for this job, sir? Because you're a woman, you mean? Of course. What kind of business did you think you were getting into? BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Carl Singer has a question for witness number 137. I'm sorry, but are we to understand that David Cartwright, who I gather was something of a mover in the shadows, an eminence grise, yes, Sir Winston allows his wisdom to fall on the assembled committee like a benediction. Without ever holding the highest office himself, he was a close adviser to at least three first desks. Thank you, Sir Winston. So a grandee of the park, at very least. And are we to understand that he mistrusted this Brinsley Miles? Thought that he might be a traitor? Alison North says, Cartwright knew that Miles had spent time behind the wall, that he'd been a Joe, which few of the suits at the park ever had. And if Miles had decided to fold his tent the wrong way, he wanted to know about it. All right if I go on? Please do. Just a day or so after Cartwright instructed me to spend time with Miles outside the office, he invited me out for the evening. It was only because she'd waylaid him on the stairs. She'd been working through a stack of expense accounts and had found a slip for a cash withdrawal of 5,000 US dollars from house funds, at the top of which was printed the word basilisk. When she heard Miles' office door above close, she scrambled to make sure she appeared on the staircase as he descended. Could we talk about your expenses claim? It's been approved, but it doesn't accord with the official template. He'd splashed some aftershave on and the recent past which almost but didn't quite mask the odours of tobacco and liquor. I need you to fill it out again, properly. Is that a fact? Do you have it with you? She handed it to him. He glanced at it, nodded, crumpled it up and tossed it down the stairs. Very adult. You hungry? Get your coat. I could eat a whore. I beg your pardon? I could eat a horse. What's the matter? Your ears need syringing. Miles hailed a cab, giving the driver an instruction she didn't catch. The cab ploughed through streets that grew lighter and broader, then narrower and darker again, as if the journey were some kind of parable. When they eventually came to a halt, it didn't seem to Alison that they'd arrived anywhere. There was a row of shops ahead, each specialising in sexual novelties, it seemed, with mannequins attired in faux leather lingerie. A blow-up doll, its mouth an astonished O, slumped against one window. You bring me to the nicest places, she thought. Beyond the sex shops, Miles stopped at an open doorway, its inner recesses obscured by a bead curtain. She felt little surprised that a strip club waited below. Miles shrugged off his coat, and she followed him to a table against a far wall. The room wasn't full. 
On a small stage, a skinny girl in her teens worked her way out of some complicated underwear. I'll have a whiskey, Miles said to the waitress. Large. A glass of red wine, please, Alison said. Miles loosened his tie. Did we have to come here? she asked him. Food surprisingly good, Miles said, lighting a cigarette. Their drinks arrived. Miles picked his up. So, how's it going, your, um, visitation here? She said, it's going. I'm working my way through your protocols. Expense claims, too. That's going to the heart of the matter. Well, you know what it's like at the park? They keep a tight hold on the purse strings. How long are you in the job there, anyway? A year? More like ten months. I think they always send a newbie, part of the training. Yeah, see, now that's puzzling me. From what I'd heard, when they're going over the books, they send a heavy team in. Anything dodgy, someone is leaned on. That's something you're good at, Alison North? Leaning on people? We won't know till I've tried it, she replied. Brinsley Miles. He laughed and turned his gaze to the dancer. He might have been watching someone wait for a bus. They weren't alone any more. Hello, Miles, someone said, only he used another name. He was a short, thin man with twitchy eyes. He was smiling, his teeth small and sharp and grey. His trousers and jacket had seen better days. Not going to introduce me to your new friend? Dicky Bow, Miles said in a flat voice. Alison North. Dicky's a... what shall we call you? I want to say resident rat catcher, except you're not so much a catcher as a rat, are you? He's having a laugh, miss, aren't you, Miles? Sorry about that slip. Names are tricky things when they change on you. Everything's tricky to the constantly challenged, and you'll know when I'm having a laugh, Dicky. Miles's face was set in concrete. Dicky pushed his fingers through his slicked back hair. There's something stirring in the undergrowth, Miles, just the sort of thing you like to hear about. I've heard this song before. The last time we got up close and personal, Dicky, I remember a certain property being mentioned, on sale for a certain price, but then it turned out the price had skyrocketed on account of the seller becoming aware of my interest, almost as if you were doing a favour for someone else entirely. Oh, uh, it was a misunderstanding, that's all. I swear I'm not carrying water for anyone else. Sure you're not, Miles said. I can't stand the sight of you, Dicky. Get out. Dicky made a quick exit, slipping through the crowd and out the door, rat-like. You weren't very nice to him. No? What did he mean, anyway? He would carry water for whoever asked. He's good at following people, Miles said. I'll give him that. But he's a fuck-up, and that's dangerous. If I had my way, they'd have a department all to themselves, keep him off the streets. What else do you do? Listen to people like him? Give them money for stories? Mostly. This is the spook zoo, and what happens in a zoo is the animals get fed. And who feeds you? Is that what Cartwright sent you here to find out? No. You're going to have to learn to lie better than that. And something else. The glass that had been full was suddenly empty. How to make your expenses seem both plausible and necessary. The committee takes a short break. Alison North has a story to tell, Griselda Fleet was thinking. She lined up her notebook, tin of mints, reading glasses, pencil, and is ready to restart the session just as soon as the chatter has died down. We all know the bare bones of her tale, of course, having had access to the file, but the details she is offering here put flesh on a skeleton. It was akin to viewing the artist's model rather than the mere sketch. A clearing of her throat suffices to alert the panel that their attention is now required again. Miss North, are you ready? After that first night, there were others. She remembered drinking more than she was used to, which was a drop in Miles's ocean. As to whether she'd enjoyed herself, that wasn't relevant. Try to win his trust, Cartwright had told her. To which Alison's footnote was, how better than to watch him drink? He seemed to want an audience. 
that he was as open and relaxed as an iceberg. Only once did she think she caught a genuine reaction from him, when the three of them, a trio by then, found themselves in a club with a band in the corner. Otis had been telling her about how the young in the East saw reunification as occupation. Otis was capable of remaining in lecture mode indefinitely, but they noticed Miles was paying even less attention than usual, focused instead on the band. Nice tune, Otis said. Miles grunted. Now can you stop banging on like a social studies broadcast and order some drinks? I've known teetotalers quicker to the bar. Later, Otis commented to Alison, I never thought our Miles had a musical soul. This new friend's name wasn't really Otis, of course, but that was the name on the folder that would ultimately capture these events. At the time, they called him Rutger, though that wasn't his name either. One time, they collected her to go for a weekend drive in Otis's pearl-white 1969 Chevrolet Camaro convertible with red leather seats. It made Alison feel like she was in Greece. Otis was wearing a pink jacket and cream trousers, Saturday clothes, while Miles wore one of his regular suits, enhanced by a fresh stain on the lapel, tie knotted an inch lower than usual to mark the weekend. You're not exactly dressed the part, she told him. I had a leather jacket once, he said. Made me look like Van Morrison. Well, that's not so... Now, like Van Morrison looks now. Oh, I'm sorry. Reported back to Cartwright yet? The change of gear was so slick she nearly gave an honest response, which was presumably the point. I... He's not in my line of report. He wouldn't even know who I was. But you've encountered him. Oh, yes, obviously. He's around the park a lot. Heard he's a grandpa now. He chewed this over, as if contemplating all the futures that might await David Cartwright's grandson. Then, pity the poor kid. Otis was struggling under the hood of the car, some engine trouble. Try the ignition, Alison? She shuffled into the driver's seat and turned the key. Nothing happened. There's a bar over there. Miles said, without indicating any particular direction. Any time she was with Miles, any time Otis turned up, there'd be a bar, sooner or later. It was obvious Otis and Miles were companions of long standing, who knew each other the way card sharps know the deck. Once, when left on their own, Otis warned her, Be careful, Alison. I like you. I like Miles too, but he's not safe company. And he stayed here in Berlin for a reason which is? He's hunting a tiger. Strange place to do that. It's a zoo, remember? Of course we have tigers. But tigers in zoos are safe. Depends what side of the bars you're on. None of this detail really seems to be what the inquiry wants to hear, but the memories, given encouragement, clamber over the wall of the past. It's as if she's reliving, in fast motion, those weeks in another millennium. As she talks, Alison feels she is both spinning a web and caught in its centre. Then comes a ping, the tolling of someone's incoming text. Everyone reaches for their phone, and out of the assorted fumblings, clarity rises. I'm sorry, says Griselda Fleet, then clears her throat and repeats. I'm sorry. A message from the Home Office, she says. It seems monochrome has been discontinued. With immediate effect. Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts.
Our friend has had a turn. She'll be fine. Shelley was holding a bottle of water to the woman's mouth, in a vague approximation of someone who knew about turns and how to handle them. Have you called an ambulance? Oh, this happens a lot. When her meds kick in, she'll be fine. If you're sure. Max gave him a thumbs-up gesture. The concerned dog walker, civic duty done, moved on, and their female captive, propped between them, made a low moan. Max wasn't sure where they were. A grassed-over area hemmed by trees, a deserted children's playground. They were a ten-minute walk or so from the pub. The woman slumped forward and would have slid from the bench if Shelley hadn't prevented her. Thank you, by the way, Max said. I'd say you were welcome, but I still wish you'd never turned up at my door. Yet you were there when I needed you. What else was I supposed to do? It occurred to me that if you had the idea of going hunting for John Batchua, they might work out the same thing and be waiting for you. Whoever they are. Yes. I don't think John betrayed me, you know, not deliberately. And he came out fighting when it mattered. So did I. And he's for the shove, I can tell you. They're calling it streamlining. Welcome to the new austerity. Auxiliary services can better be met by the private sector, unquote. Vetting will be next, the big money spinner. The woman between them said, more or less distinctly, Fuck. The witness had been composed, seemingly unsurprised to have her testimony cut short. Malcolm accompanied her downstairs once the lift was free and found himself on the pavement with her, as if she were a fragile relative he was unlikely to meet again. She used his full name when bidding him farewell. You shouldn't worry, she said. He hadn't been aware it showed. It feels like an ending, but it's only a setback. As he rode back upstairs, he wondered whether she was referring to monochrome or his career. Either way, she was clearly in error. They'd been dropped by text like a rock star's girlfriend. What do you think happened? he asked Griselda over a last cup of tea. I think someone at the park, first desk, didn't like the fact we had the Otis file. Didn't want the panel to hear the witness elaborating on it. We hadn't even reached the major parts yet. That stolen expenses money, the trap they were building, the tiger he was hunting. Alison wants us to know what was really going on, Malcolm said, and First Desk doesn't. I mean, it's called the Secret Service for a reason. Well, that's it now, isn't it? Monochrome's a dead duck. But is it really? Griselda said. In her office, First Desk was weighing up the day's contents, an exercise which, as ever, promoted mixed feelings. Monochrome was over, and mosquitoes slapped against a wall. Fabian de Vries, too, had been dealt with. She'd had an email confirming that the Dutch businessman's tender for control of landscaping, the service's vetting procedures, had been quietly withdrawn, as she had hoped. This battle won, First Desk knew she might wake up one morning and discover the war to be lost but she could protect the nation one threat at a time. She decided to patrol her domain. The boys and girls on the hub were used to this, her silent presence at their shoulders watching them work. This evening, most were engaged in surveillance of a trio of young women whose recent purchases suggested their involvement in a bomb factory, which meant phones being tracked, movements analysed and their immediate futures planned. Good job, First Desk murmured. This was passed around the room like a parcel at a party, all present unwrapping a layer and handing it on. She continued her rounds down the staircase, each of whose landings was decorated with a single portrait of one of her predecessors. She stopped when she reached Charles' partner's likeness. Strange, given his ancient treachery. But like many in ancient sin, partners had been buried deep. It might be whispered of in careless corners, but had never been officially recognised. So here he still hung. First desk reached the archive level. Molly Doran's domain. The lighting here was dimmer than elsewhere. First desk felt glad of it for no reason other than it was soothing, sometimes, to remain in shadow. 
Stepping inside, she saw her erstwhile assistant, Erin Gray, at a desk to the left, a lamp angled to pool its light precisely on the book in front of her. A recent reassessment of the British Empire's involvement in the slave trade. Where's Molly? Home, I expect. I didn't think she went home. People can surprise you. The point of our profession is making sure they don't. A little light reading? Erin said she was thinking of doing a master's. Sideways move, ma'am. Maybe academia, history. You're not happy here, then? The leakage of talent from the park was an issue that couldn't be ignored. Meeting her gaze, Erin replied carefully, I have been. But no longer. We seem to spend more time fending off threats from within than defending ourselves from dangers without. With all that's going on in the world, why is playing politics the prevailing narrative? Look at green shoots, the privatisation, and monochrome, for that matter. Monochrome is finished. And green shoots? Well, the fact is, we're a country on the edge of bankruptcy, so if it's a choice between taking private money or seeing no money at all... First desk made to leave, then turned back. Remember this. You will only get to spend your days looking at the past because some of us are guarding the present. And while that can mean wasting time and resources on fighting battles that shouldn't need to be fought, if I don't fight those, the park loses. And then the enemy's already won. Later, back in her office, she thought, Erin was right. It was unfortunate that all of her fighting seemed to be done with one hand tied behind her back. She noted that another email had come in from the Home Secretary. It was a heads-up. The new front-runner for the vetting tender was Cleaner Money and had a UK passport. His name was Carl Singer. Now, thought First Desk, where have I heard that name recently? In the office, Griselda was rifling through paperwork like a card shop, plucking out a page and laying it in front of Malcolm. These are the instructions I received two years ago. It says here, in the absence of the President of the Committee, regulation of the panel shall fall to its secretary. You, said Malcolm. Me, agreed Griselda. Congratulations. But what's the use of that when monochrome's been shut down? Has it? Did you actually hear Sir Winston close it down? He left the building without saying or doing anything that might be interpreted as an official termination of proceedings. Malcolm sipped his tea. It should appall him where Griselda was going with this, but it didn't. What do you intend to do? Exactly what Sir Winston would have instructed if he had grasped what was required of him. I intend, with your help, to prepare and deliver the panel's findings on the subject it was convened to investigate and we can't do that without hearing the rest of the testimony. He said, carefully, just us. We'd be in quarret. Griselda shuffled another page. As acting president, I think that will be more than requisite. Is this wise? We're past wise, Malcolm. Somebody got the wind up when we called in a witness about Otis. Now we'll be sent into the wilderness, no doubt. So why shouldn't we, just this once, wag the dog? Feels like an ending, but it's only a setback, he said. What? It was something Alison said. You think she'd be prepared to continue? Oh, said Malcolm, yes. Yes, I think she would. Across town, Max was saying, Tell me who you're working for, or I'll drown you in the nearest puddle. That's not necessary, Shelley chided. Whose side are you? There's a pond right over there, she said. People, said the woman, faintly. There are people about, agreed Max. A risk, but not as big a risk as you. Shelley said, Our friend here, he's already mashed your face into his floor and I broke a stick on your head, so you're two strikes down while we're both upright. How much are you getting paid for this? Because it's not enough. Animal, the woman said. I'm not the one busting into your house at night, he thought, armed with a taser backed by a gang of thugs. Scum, she made to get up. Who did they tell you I am? What did I do? Because you've been lied to. 
I'm a retired academic, and you're either a vigilante or private security. Which is it? Screw you, pedo. Max and Shelley exchanged glances, light dawning. Shelley said, That's why you attacked his place. You think he's a paedophile? But if this is an online pylon, a case of mistaken identity, alarms would have rung. So this is a private enterprise. Who's pulling your strings? Max flexed his arm. Keep playing the hero and Max will break your leg. And I'm not a pro, said Max, which means it'll hurt a lot. The woman mumbled something. Four corners. Feeling better yet? The concerned dog walker was back round on his second circuit. All good now, Max said. The woman added, I'm OK. You heading towards the high street? Can do. She got to her feet. Take care now, said Shelley. Don't be a stranger. The dog walker moved on, the woman following. Come on, said Max. They set off towards a different gate, caught a bus heading towards the city. Max was mostly looking out the window. Darkness had fallen and life was stretching its envelope. It tugged at hidden memories, all this activity, dragging a different identity to the surface. Four corners. Shelley was on her phone. Um, private, uh, personal protection services, it says here. And who runs it? I'll find something. Which she did, ten minutes later. The name Carl Singer mean anything? Not a thing. Head Hobnob, CEO of Singer Industries, of which Four Corners is a subsidiary. He's reasonably well known. I mean, I've heard of him. Gets interviewed on business pages. Impossible to believe he's mixed up in skullduggery, then. Such a cynic. What next? What next? Good question. Max said, Probably ought to look him up, don't you think? This Carl Singer. I mean, apart from anything else, either window latch needs paying for. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. And here we are again, she thought, surveying Monochrome's conference room. We're very grateful you agreed to come in today, Griselda says. We can begin whenever you are ready. Alison was reasonably sure that the night she broke into Miles's office was the one that started in the club in a basement below the supermarket. Miles found them a table. The place smelled of sickly sweet hash. It was heaving. Mr Otis. A man at a nearby table came over as soon as they sat down. Forties, lank dark hair, a trim beard. The newcomer nodded to Miles and Alison. I understand you've come into possession of a property... Unusual buy in today's market. Otis said, I have faith in the coming economic boom. It has an interesting history, your building. Squatters, too. If it ever turns out you want to rid yourself of them, I can perhaps be of assistance. Just remember the name, Dieter Schultz. Mention it anywhere. When he left, neither Otis nor Miles said anything. What, Alison said at last, was all that about? You've bought a house, Otis? Did you think I was homeless? You wouldn't want to live in it, though, Miles said. Squatters. Ghosts, too, I hear. You're both very annoying, you realise that? Miles stage whispered. She's touchy tonight. Oh, do fuck off. Her own vehemence surprised her. She forced her way through the throng and left, hurrying but trying not to appear hurried. When she reached the station house, it was in darkness. She found the keys in the house mother's office and plucked Miles's set, then climbed the stairs. Look for notes, memos, jottings, Cartwright had said. 
Earlier that day, she'd had a showdown with Robin Bruce, the station house's affable headmaster. There's a large withdrawal being made from your house funds, in cash. You authorised it, and it's marked Basilisk. Basilisk, said Robin carefully. One of Miles. All above board, post-operational, welfare, really. Bit of a touchy subject. Go on. Miles had an asset, you see, back when the wall still stood. An officer in the Stasi. Can you imagine what bravery that must have taken? Anyway, after the wall came down, over on their side, they must have known they'd had a leak. But what they didn't know, and somehow found out, maybe a year ago, was that this asset was a woman. And so she paid the price. Not only her, either. What do you mean? We can only assume they had incomplete information, just her gender and rank. There were only two other women of the same rank in the Stasi during that time frame. All three were hanged. We received a photograph, came through the post like a catalogue. Three in a row, in a forest. Miles is Joe, plus the others. Irons tied to their feet. Makes the wire cut tighter, I gather. Alison tried to speak, but there was nothing to say. He went on. A man was in the photo too, back to camera, looking at them. Miles is sure he was responsible. He wants revenge. And he needs the basilisk funds to get it. And do you trust him? She was his Joe. So, yes, it's a debt of honour. Miles's desk drawers were a mess. So much so that it was easy to suspect it was deliberate, because who could find anything? On his desk was a paperweight, a lump of rock that might have been actual wall. Underneath she saw a piece of paper. German words in a column. A coded list. If you're planning on walking out with that, you're looking at twenty years minimum. Her heart stopped. This, this is a shopping list, she said, trying to make sure her voice didn't wobble. Treason's treason, whichever way you slice it said Miles. He opened the bottle of whisky that sat on his filing cabinet and filled a streaky glass to the brim. What did Cartwright expect you to find? There was no point in trying to lie. Evidence of wrongdoing? Seen any? I know you turned down an offer of booty. Sent the seller packing. She was referring to Dickie Bow, the agent who had approached them in a bar a few weeks earlier, offering information. Miles picked up his glass. Yes, and then he sold the fact that I didn't buy it. Why didn't you, though? Shall I tell you how this business works? See, sometimes you say no because you want everyone to think you've already got it. Who was the seller? A Russian? A Russian, he mimicked. Yes, it was a Russian. Through Dicky, I knocked him back so that they'd think our service is two steps ahead of them. Except things get a little more complicated now, so listen carefully. This particular Russian was in the pay of the Americans. The Yanks are sending information through our system, like an iodine trace, to see how long it takes the Kremlin to render it worthless. That way they can work out how efficient the mole in our service is. The what? Probably best not to tell too many people. You don't want to cause unnecessary panic. He seemed amused, but she could see the anger underneath. She tugged that thread. You don't seem too concerned. We're spooks. We spy. And we know who it is. We do. I do. And so does Cartwright. I told him. So, when he sends you along to find out if I'm on the straight and narrow, he's not doing it because he thinks I'm a traitor. He's doing it for some other reason entirely. Her head was reeling. And what reason's that? Yeah, said Miles. That's the question, isn't it? In the committee room, rain lashes the windows, because this is what rain does. Wait, Malcolm Kyle makes the interruption. So you're saying that there was a mole in the park in the early 90s? I don't remember reading about anything. Alison North smiled sweetly for him. If subtitles were available, hers would now read, Bless. 
Miles uncovered the traitor, but Cartwright sat on this news for months, then decided he needed Miles to take care of it for him. And to ensure Miles would agree, he wanted a little edge. Do what I ask or be accused of treason, or of taking funds for yourself. Griselda said, but what exactly did Cartwright want Miles to do? Kill the traitor. Murder him and make it look like suicide. But weren't there any number of agents able to do that without going to such lengths? For a start, said Alison, this traitor was Miles' own former handler, his mentor, back in the day, who went on to become first desk. Not the sort of hit job you get just anyone to do. But that happened later. It's not what this story's about. Malcolm makes a mental calculation. 1994, first desk. The traitor must have been Charles' partner. He looks over at Griselda, but it's impossible to tell what's on her mind. Shall I go on? says Alison. And she does. Her legs were trembling. If she was a spook, she'd been caught on her first operation. Miles was talking again, but she interrupted. I know about Basilisk. You're taking money, and I can guess what you're doing with it. You had a Joe. She got burned. And that conversation you had about the house with that man, Dieter, tonight in the bar, it's connected. Otis told me you're hunting a tiger. So is the house your trap? She struck home. Otis, he said, has many good qualities. Failing to be a loudmouth dick is not always one of them. Otis is not on your official contact list. This operation is out of bounds. This is Berlin. You think I write down names? That's how people get killed. Did you write her name down? Your Stasi asset. Did your tiger find out? He is the man in the photo, yes? With those women hanging from a tree. And you're using service money to get him. Go home. His face was expressionless. And when you speak to Cartwright, tell him there's only one rotten apple he needs to worry about, right under his nose. When she came into work the next day, Alison found Miles in his office, still wearing the same clothes. Come on, you can buy me breakfast. He reached for a hat. Broad-brimmed, it gave him a gangsterish look. They were joined by Otis on the corner. He was wearing a hat, too. I think we need a lot of coffee. He smiled. Which they took in the park, cardboard cups steaming in the air. She looked at a row of call boxes by the railing. She could phone Cartwright right now and pull the curtain down on this whole mess. They walked, Miles dropping back a few steps as if he were their minder, while Otis talked. He was a black marketeer, he said. A fixer, not a spook. And yet you're helping him find his tiger. One man's tiger is everybody's problem, said Otis. And what did this tiger ever do to you? He hanged my sister. His sister, Miles's Joe. Oh, I'm so sorry. What else could you say? This house we've bought, it's an old Stasi safe house. Last year, a cabinet was found in rubble under a similar house in the former Eastern Bloc, containing records, dates, times, personnel. Dangerous stuff for those who want to bury their past. The boys who found it sold the information. What happened once might happen again. So, now you're spreading the word you've got something. That's the idea. Stasi officer Karl Schenker was senior enough his name might well feature in some records, even though he's now changed his identity. And was officially reported as dead of a heart attack back in 91, said Miles, getting in stride with them. But it's him in that photo with the women, said Otis. I'm sure of it. I met him once with my sister. Miles's asset. He doesn't reply. Maybe his sister was one of the others, Alison thought. Did it matter? She was still his sister. The point is, Otis was saying, Schenker's not dead, and he'll have his ear to the ground. The man in the club last night, Alison asked. Dieter Schultz. He was taking your bait. Miles shrugged. One among many. Well, not many, but some. 
they'd reached the park gate. We just need a couple of weeks, Alison, said Miles, for him to show himself. Even if this thing does work, you're hip deep in shit. Help me catch this bastard and you can hang me out to dry after. All friends again now, said Otis. A few yards away stood a man with a camera, a sign outlining his fees. Ah, someone who can take our photo. Come on. You look great in that hat, Miles. And how many times are you going to look great in your life? Miles said, First she's screwing with my op, now I'm having my picture taken. I'll give you a week, Alison told him. Suddenly he was smiling. I can live with that. Are you coming or not? Otis called. So they followed him and had their picture taken. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. In the silence of the committee's meeting room, Malcolm picks up the photograph of the trio that is part of the file. He studies it once more, perhaps finding something different in it now he knows the circumstances in which it was taken. And that's what you did, is it? It's Griselda who's speaking, her voice a little rusty. You gave him a week for his plan to work before letting David Cartwright know what he was up to. It's what I told him, yes. But not what you did. I talked to Cartwright later that day. I thought Miles was in danger of getting himself and Otis killed. Malcolm has a question. So you believed this Schenker was a real threat? He'd hanged three women in a wood, so yes. Griselda says, Are you all right to continue? We can take a break if you prefer. The witness, answering a different question, says, Cartwright couldn't call Miles home, of course. Doing that would mean explaining to the park that Miles had diverted funds for his own use, or was planning a revenge op, which was enough to have him recalled, but it would have rendered him useless for Cartwright's purposes. You don't have a hold over someone if everyone already knows what they've done. Griselda, faltering now, says, or we could just... I'm fine to go on, if you're sure. The witness clearly is sure. She left work late that evening, having spent hours in an indeterminate state. I am not really here, but nor am I anywhere else but she was safe among facts and figures. She wasn't a field agent and would be better off in a back room at the park or in one of its underground chambers, guarding its secrets and lies bound in ledgers like this one. She closed it and rested her head on its cover. Just so long as she didn't have to deal with people. She decided to stop in a bar on the way home. A world different to the dives Miles took her to, everyone wearing clothes and a range of wines behind the bar. She ordered one. The bar filled. Soon she was talking to a man in a black leather jacket over a blue open-necked shirt, his smile a little too wide, his wallet a little too open. He bought her drinks as if there were a prize waiting at the bottom of one of them. After a while it became apparent the prize was her, but she wasn't so far gone that this seemed a good idea. I need to go home now. Sure, I'll take you. No, thanks, I'll be fine. She slipped away, but not so smoothly that he wasn't still there when she reached the door. Cold air hit her like a flannel in the face, and he was still with her, one hand wrapped around her upper arm. Ow, you're hurting me. You'll get used to it. Let go. Her arm was firmly in his grip until it wasn't. There was a yelp and a crunch, and someone was on the ground. A taxi stopped, and a gentle hand was guiding her into it. She heard her address, and the taxi pulled away. You were following me. It felt like a good idea. What do you want now? The same as him? Otis said, I'll settle for knowing you are home safely. 
His arm across her shoulders felt comforting rather than predatory. He paid for the taxi, escorted her through the lobby and came up with her in the lift. When she pulled him into her bedroom, he didn't protest. You can get undressed now, she said, if you want. I don't know that Miles would like that. What's Miles got to do with it? Otis gave that serious consideration for as long as it took her to drain a glass of water. When he started to unbutton his shirt, she didn't know whether to feel happy or disappointed, but this dilemma resolved itself when he kissed her. She woke in the early hours, heart pounding, but he was still there. He was awake too. I called the park, she whispered. Told Cartwright what you're doing. He patted her shoulder softly. Okay. I had to. I want you to catch this man, Shanka, of course I do. But if you kill him... It's not necessary to kill him. We catch him, he confesses, he's punished. By law. How sure are you he'll come looking, take the bait you set? Pretty sure. Miles has put the word out. He had a drink with Dickie Bow tonight. Told him we found some old files, knowing he can't keep quiet. That'll put Schenker's name on the streets. If I was pretending to be dead like he is, I'd want to know who was digging me up. Her mouth was dry. She would have liked more water, but she was too comfortable to suggest that either of them move. Did you really buy the house? A good legend needs a solid foundation. Go back to sleep, Alison. Everything's going to be all right. In the morning, he was gone. For the next five days, everything was in stasis. Miles didn't show up to work at the station house. Her job staled. Her hours were spent trawling through the unholy trinity of outcomes, outlays, deliveries. It was a business, that was all. He turned up without fanfare, leaning on the office door, unlit cigarette in mouth. Who crapped in your coffee? She didn't know whether to feel relief or its opposite. Do you mind, she said. That's a disgust... Yeah, yeah, come on. Miles was on the pavement before she caught up, adjusting himself to others' speeds never being a big priority with him. The bar he chose was not far and surprisingly ordinary. When they sat at the table he'd chosen, against the farthest wall, next to the door to the toilets, she said, you've been keeping a low profile. We had a deal. His words came out low and fast and angry. You were supposed to give me a week, but you spoke to the park, didn't you? I gather Schenker didn't take your bait. No, he fucking didn't. And do you think that's my fault? You're telling me it's not. She hunted for a name. What about Dieter? Dieter Schultz, that man. I thought he was showing interest. So did I, except it didn't last. Dickie Bow had the story too, and he leaks like French plumbing, but no one heard, apparently. Maybe, she said, sipping her red wine, it just wasn't a good story. Didn't have to be. Even a bad story needs checking out. OK, she said. Yes, I told Cartwright. It's my job. But what do you imagine? That he spread the word in Berlin, warning former Stasi officers not to worry about fairy tales? You tell me he's just a suit, and suddenly he can reach out and warn a man he's being hunted, when you and Otis can't even discover what Schenker's calling himself now. Make your mind up. I never said he wasn't a smart bastard, but he's playing by the wrong rules. There are rules now. My Joe was murdered. That's against the rules. She'd never seen him like this. I was trying to make sure you didn't get hurt, Miles. You think I need you watching my back? From what I've heard, you're too busy getting on your own. You really are a shit, aren't you? When did I pretend otherwise? She tilted her head, feigning puzzled. This Joe, why is she so important? They all are. How did they find out about her anyway? They didn't know who she was, that's clear. But they did manage to find out she was a woman. How did that happen? Miles's match flared as he lit a cigarette. 
It was you. What happened? Did your tongue slip? You said she instead of he in the wrong company. She sat back as the truth hit her. Oh, God, that's exactly it, isn't it? The mole. You told the mole all about your asset. You betrayed her all by yourself. And that's how you worked out he was the mole. Because she ended up killed. Miles didn't flinch. Then he drained his whiskey glass in one swallow. Bright girl. He stood abruptly. Turn in your keys. They'll book you a flight. I haven't finished the... You've done what you were sent to do. What do you want, a victory parade? Then he was gone, his cigarette still burning in the ashtray. Otis appeared from behind her. Again? You're following me again? He put up his hands. Not following. Miles told me you'd be here. Okay if I sit? Do what you like. He lowered himself into the seat Miles vacated, saying... He was angry. He made that clear. And you told him about the other night. Thanks for that. Little bit of bragging to the boys, was it? Alison. I didn't say a word to him. Honest. He just worked it out for himself? Even as she was saying the words, she realised that was exactly what he'd done. She swirled her wine glass. Your plan didn't work, she said at last. Otis made a small, exploding shape with his hands. Kaput. And I'm going home, apparently. Probably for the best. Would another drink help? It wouldn't hurt. He fetched her another glass of wine and a Coke for himself. You're drinking Coke? Driving. Seriously? That convertible? The one that broke down? It's fine now. This is Berlin. There's always someone who can bring a car back to life. He finished his coke. I am sorry that we didn't get to know each other better. Or more slowly, perhaps. There is still time, she considered saying, but there wasn't. They both knew that. I'll give you a lift home. I've had a lift home from you before, remember? You can drive this time. I've had two glasses of wine. That's the minimum requirement here in Berlin. The Camaro was parked by his mechanic's house. They took a cab there and found it under a street light, looking twice as American somehow. Too big, too brash, too look at me. Otis put his hand on his car's flank. It looks good. Looking good wasn't the problem, said Alison. Not working, that was the problem. Hansi had the keys. He scanned the house opposite. Four storeys, three with balconies. I can't remember which flat. Sound the horn. I'll do it. She climbed into the convertible, feeling she wasn't dressed the part. She needed lipstick, a white dress, shades. But she managed. She secretly hoped for an aruga, but got a one-note blare instead. Immediately, a light appeared overhead. A figure came out on the balcony, shouting a greeting to Otis. There was a glinting in the gloom and the sound of keys hitting the pavement. Otis scooped them up, tossing them over to her. She caught them one-handed. He clapped. I'm impressed. Ain't seen nothing yet, she said, in a passable Marilyn Monroe, slotting the key into the ignition and turning it. In the bright moment that followed, her life divided in two. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. In the silence that had followed Alison's calm recollection of the bomb that had taken her legs, all in the room had become aware that rain had stopped falling. Alison herself had fallen quiet, not, Malcolm thought, because she had shocked herself, but because this was the natural conclusion to her story. Was Karl Schenker ever caught? Malcolm's hands were shaking. 
No. Griselda said quietly, Why did he do it, even? He got word there were hunters after him, so he got rid of them. That's what he does. But how could he have known about Otis and Miles's trap for him? Malcolm's puzzlement was obvious. David Cartwright, said Griselda. It must have been him. But why? And who leaked the Otis file to us? Who knows, said Alison. For some while, Molly Doran's solitary court down in the park's archive had been shared with a young woman with abundant red hair, a former assistant to the first desk. Molly could easily have seen Erin Gray off, but something stayed her hand. Every sorcerer needs an apprentice. This green shoots business, the girl said one day. The privatisation. I'm going to do some research. Do you want my blessing? Molly asked. Just letting you know what I'm up to. It had been early December when the young woman brought the first fruits of her endeavours to Molly's desk, a tribute that turned Molly's universe upside down. What she saw in Erin's report ignited a memory. A bar, too much wine. A man in a black leather jacket over a blue open-necked shirt, his smile a little too wide, his wallet a little too open. Then Otis, coming to her rescue. Erin was asking something. Why would this man risk his new life just to plug a gap that might not even be there? Otis wouldn't have a clue who he is now. That's a 99% certainty, Molly agreed. But Shanker is a 1% player. Erin recalled how she'd been sent to crash trolleys in the supermarket with Malcolm Kyle and slipped the Otis folder into his shopping. And you're okay with all of it? Putting Otis in danger, I mean. Molly barely glanced at the stumps of her legs. Yes, she said. I'm okay with that. The restaurant was on Park Lane. Max took a seat on a bench opposite, resigning himself to a wait. Carl Singer was dining in there, and if he could lead Max to whoever lit the fuse, he'd wait as long as it took. There were other thoughts to occupy him. Images of Berlin emerged, unbidden. Particularly of those last weeks when Alison North had arrived. After the bomb, he'd never seen her again. He'd been spirited off by the park, with the full passport package, a home and a salary, and all he had to do was let himself be uprooted. There was a camera on a lamppost twenty yards away. He positioned himself so that it had as narrow a view of his profile as possible. Let's get eyes inside, shall we? First desk said. She'd had a watch put on Singer ever since she found out that he was not only the new front-runner for the vetting tendering process, but also sat on the monochrome inquiry. First desk enjoyed coincidences the way she liked happy endings. The door cam there was already being piggybacked in the hub. The angle clearly showed Singer at his table, but his companion remained a rear view only, the back of a bald and cratered head. Their face recognition programme was already shuffling through some choices, then picked a face from its library. First desk leaned in. Well, there's interesting. What's Carl Singer doing breaking bread with Fabian de Vries? He was in his seventies, Singer thought, but fit and healthy. Since settling in the UK from his native Holland, de Vries had increased his fortune by means of, in turn, a payday loan company, online gambling, and virtual reality porn. He wouldn't be the first or last to grow rich exploiting his fellow man's weaknesses. And Singer's own weaknesses currently included a hole in his finances big enough to pass a camel through. Back at the park, First Desk was asking, What about ears? A pretty young man with a white smile headed over to the diners, the blue light on his headset winking as he offered menus. Congratulations, I in order. De Vries was saying, you are now the front-runner in the vetting tender. Meaning you've effectively won after all. Nobody needs to know you're my proxy. First desk said, let's do a trawl of the surrounding area. Be good to know if our friend has a travelling band. On the bench outside the restaurant, Max cracked his knuckles, waiting for Singer to help him find his quarry. 
A grin crept across his features. One picked up in the hub on incoming CCTV, the software IDing his face in moments. Well, look at that, First Desk said. Let's bring him home, shall we? Friend of yours? De Vries asked Singer as they emerged from the restaurant to see a man crossing the road towards them. Max was letting the moment carry him. Singer's companion was a stranger, except there was something about the shape of his head. Could it be Schenker? He was a few yards away when something black dropped over his head and suddenly he was airborne, then flat on his back, not on the pavement but in a gap between seats. A door slammed, a black SUV sped off. What was all that about? De Vries said. Just a little local difficulty, I'm sure, said Singer. Aren't our security services wonderful? De Vries established a connection with Carl Singer because Singer was on monochrome and in need of money, First Desk knew now. But she wasn't satisfied. She was sure there was a spy on the panel, someone else. She ate a sandwich at her desk, read the timelines and studied the dossier Erin Gray had compiled on green shoots with a rare photo of Fabienne de Vries. When she'd gone to collect the dossier from the archive, Molly had explained how she'd recognised him and set the wheels of her plan in motion. First desk had to ask, Brinsley Miles, he's who I think he is, right? Of course he bloody is, said Molly. It was after three in the morning now, but that didn't stop her. She frosted the wall of her office and made a call. Then she summoned her latest assistant. I've someone to see, something to borrow. I won't be long. My new PS, is she still on shift? First Desk's personal security went with the service chief every step she took outdoors. She is, yes. Did you want to meet her? No, just so long as she's on the ball. She hesitated. No soft landings. Make sure she knows. The phone woke Ratty just after 4am, though he gave no hint of this when he answered. It's me. Toad sounded nervous. We need to talk. First desk just woke me up. She wants to see me. I'm frightened. I'm sure you have nothing to worry about. But maybe you do. We need to meet face to face. Do we? Bring cash. There's a flat I can use on Calthorpe Street. He noted the number. Now, come now. He summoned his driver. The flat was on the third floor, its big windows fully lit, uncurtained. He pressed the bell and was buzzed in. On the sofa sat first desk. Not who you were expecting, I know. Her gaze was steady and fixed on him. She offered him a cup of coffee, then began. Miss Fleet, Toad, that is, tells us you approached her to report on the activities of monochrome. Why? Oh, and I should let you know that I have tapes of your meeting with Carl Singer earlier this evening. Is that quite legal? Miss Fleet suspects you had personal reasons for wanting to be abreast of the inquiry. Personal? Calmly, he sipped the coffee. I mean, you had good cause for wanting to know if the name Carl Schenker came up. That would have given you a scare, no? You're going to have to explain who that is, I'm afraid. No, I'm not. Still the steady gaze. Do you really need to be told, said de Vries, that any attempt to smear my name will meet with official resistance? A sudden twinge from his bladder disconcerted him, but he spoke on. You're clutching at straws. He tried to abduct Max Janicek, using Singer's security people. I have no idea what or who you're talking about. More coffee? Thank you, no. And if you'll excuse me, might I use the bathroom? Of course, she indicated, through there. He went into the bathroom, aware of his bladder's demands, but not so keenly that his attention wasn't grabbed by what was sitting on the toilet lid. What the hell? There's a gun in here. He picked it up a Russian make. He'd used one of these in the past. What do you mean? Her reply was drenched in panic. Good God! He could hear her getting to her feet in the other room. Some idiot must have left. 
Bring it out. Are you sure it's real? He pushed through the door, gun in hand. As he did so, First Desk threw her own hands in the air and screamed. A chip of glass burst from the window. His body hit the floor as his bladder relaxed for the final time. First Desk reached for her comms device and switched it on. Good job, she said. Bastard was going to kill me. Already there were people running up the stairs. First Desk's back garden was an unloved space, tended by professionals. Through the glass doors she could see an untidy shape slumped over the wooden table, cigarette fizzing in its paw. She sighed and went to join him, collecting a bottle of wine and glasses on the way. But her companion produced a bottle of talisker from the pocket of his grubby overcoat. It was already uncapped. He held it out and clinked her wine glass. They sat and drank. After a bit, he spoke. Are we pretending you did all this for a dead Joe? In part, yes. But mostly to prevent him from getting his hands on your precious service, because letting an amoral, self-serving bastard through the door would harsh the park's mellow. I'm in charge of the park, like it or not, she said. Just another day's work. Something I'm not clear about, she said, after a pause. Apparently, Cartwright warned Schenker about your trap, if you can call it that. How did he do it? Classified ad? Solar flare? No, said her companion. Cartwright told Charles' partner what Otis and I were up to. He knew partner would send word to Moscow, and they'd know how to reach Schenker. Understanding dawned. So he used the park's own traitor to blow your op. That's right. Then I'd have to do what he wanted. Which was to kill partner. First desk was nodding. It might have been admiration. He was a twisty bastard. Welcome to our world. Looking her in the eye, he said, I'll not get my gun back, will I? I'll have to owe you. Everyone does, he grumbled. He stood up to leave, only to freeze in place, staring down the garden as if something had caught his attention. Whatever it was didn't stay, but in that moment he looked different, as though caught in the act of remembering another life. This didn't last more than a second or so. Still, she wondered who he'd glimpsed, and thought about it on and off for the rest of the day long after he'd left.